Well, we are going to uh, take a small detour. I believe it'll be just a one-week detour from our journey through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we are going to, I'm going to open this sermon from a reading from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. But the greater message of this sermon is going to be understanding the so-called problem of evil. So Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 1, I'll read through verse 5. There were some present at that very time who told him, that is Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which brings such clarity, such encouragement, such hope. Father, may it bring those things this morning. Father, give us the eyes, each one of us, the eyes to see the things that we need to see, hear the things that we need to hear. We're so grateful for the opportunity to repent, to be forgiven. Father, may people do so today, whether it's here, across our county, across our country, across this globe, that you would be glorified. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a quick background about this text that I read to you here. Um, so there are some disciples who are coming to Jesus, and they ask him these questions. They ask him about uh, these Galileans uh, who, whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. And what happened was that there were Galileans who were worshiping God. And Pontius Pilate sent in Roman authorities and they, in this house of worship, they slaughtered all the worshipers. And the sacrifices that the Jews were making at the time uh, were then mingled with the blood of those people that were slaughtered. And then there's another incident that we're told of here where uh, some sort of tower building, I'm unclear if people occupied the tower or not, were just near the tower. It, it just fell and killed 18 people. And so there's this question, I think this inherent question, which we find within the text. And that is, Lord, what is going on? Why all this evil? And I think we can relate to that today. I mean, just recently, within the past few weeks, on May 17th, a gunman kills 18 people in Buffalo. 18 people are just going to shop, pick up groceries. And then, as if it could be worse, to find out he was targeting the people of a specific color. On May 22nd, Guidepost Solutions released a report documenting how the Southern Baptist Convention has covered up reports of sexual abuse for a decade involving over 700 pastors. And of course, on May 24th, a gunman killed 21 people, mostly children, and wounded 17 others. In Uvalde, Texas. How do we explain this evil? How do, as Christians, and, and these are just three headlines that I, we, we heard in our prayer request, another. A 
example of this. I mean, they're untold acts of evil in the last 24 hours that have taken place. How as Christians, how do we explain this evil? What is going on? Why does it seem that God is standing by doing nothing? Why is he allowing this evil to occur? Well, the prophet Habakkuk, you know, there's these questions. What I read to you from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, these questions that I'm posing you today based on the things that we're seeing, they're not new. Habakkuk. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The oracle that Habakkuk, the prophet, saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Or cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. <clears throat> Habakkuk understood this. You know, when the Lord taught the disciples to pray, you know, I'm sure you all know the, the Lord's prayer, that last line in the prayer lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil what is Jesus acknowledging there that we are going to be surrounded by evil we are in an evil world the ruler of this world is an evil being. Even in Revelation we see this. This cry for, for justice, the, this cry for the Lord to act against this evil. Revelation ch chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? <clears throat> then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Three things there. One, they're resting, they're in rest, they're in peace, yet they see, they're able somehow to see that evil is still partaking in the world. And the Lord says, there's more yet to come. There's more yet to be done. Throughout the ages, man has wrestled with the problem of understanding evil. Those that don't believe in God, they posit these questions. If God is omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful, then he should be able to prevent evil. He is able to prevent evil. So why doesn't he? And if God is good, he would want to prevent evil. But evil exists. Therefore, they draw this conclusion that either God is not omnipotent 
or not good, or God doesn't exist. What the Lord's put on my heart this morning is to help you to see that that line of reasoning is completely false, but also to provide a level of hope and understanding as to what is going on. It's very important when you engage in discussions or uh, arguments such as this that you define terms. So I'm going to define evil. The evil that I'm preaching about this morning is moral evil. And moral evil is evil that is caused by human activity. And notice who engages in the evil acts that I mentioned in the open. All the evil that we're talking about. Who engages in those acts? Human beings. Moral evil is a behavior that contradicts the holy and perfect nature of God. And I'm going to share more about that with you in a few minutes. And just as cold is the absence of heat, evil is the absence of good. Evil is the absence of good. People that don't believe in the God of the Bible and his perfect law have no set standard by which to judge evil. Let me just I'll give you one example of that. So why is shooting a 10-year-old, why is that wrong and evil? But allowing a child who is just a few minutes into his or her life, why is allowing that child to die after that child's been assaulted by a person with medical instruments? Why is that not wrong and evil? And God sets the standard for all moral behavior through his holy word to us. What is moral and morally right is found here. Humans and their sinful fallibility seem to do two things consistently. in ignorance and unbelief regarding God's moral standard. You've heard me say this before. Most people think they're good. We're going to go to downtown camp this afternoon and do a man-on-the-street interview and ask people, are you a good person? Most people would say yes. I'm a good person. Why? Because they're measuring themselves against other people, against, they're measuring themselves against other evil people. How many lies have you told? A lot. Have you ever stolen anything? Yes. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Even one time. Use it as a curse word. Yes. Have you ever looked at another person with lust in your heart? Yes. Okay, I'm not judging you, but what you've just told me is that you're a lying Thieving, blaspheming, adulterer. When you compare yourself to God and God's standard, then you're a good person. Most criminals think they are good people. I went to and graduated from the University of Rhode Island, majored in psychology. In one of my psychology classes, watched a video, several, but this one, I'll never forget, a man who was on death row for murder was asked, are you a good person? Do you believe you're a good person? You know what his response was? 
Yet, just because I've killed people doesn't mean that I'm not a good person. Yeah, right. Like it, people do not comprehend the seriousness of their sin. Sin unleashes evil. It brings judgment. And the verdict is death. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 19. You remember Cain and Abel. And God rejects Cain's sacrifice. Because Cain just brought whatever he wanted. And the scripture tells us that Cain's face fell and he became angry. And so God confronts him. Why is your face fallen? Why have you become angry? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you turn and repent, you will be forgiven. But if you don't, beware. Sin is crouching at the door, seeking to rule over you. But you must rule over it. And the only way to do that is in and through Christ. And Cain did not hear. Cain did not listen. And we know the rest of the story. The other thing that people do is act in arrogance and violence toward God. They point the, the finger at God and put him on trial. That's the whole uh, emphasis behind this argument in terms of the problem of evil. Adam and Eve. Where are you? Why are you hiding? Oh, hey, the woman that you gave me, right? Here come the six shooters. I mean, he's got, and Eve's like, hey, wasn't me. The serpent who you put in the garden. Job. It's unbelievable. I mean, Evil things happen to Job. But he, he questions God. Job chapter 38, read it. God confronts Job and says, dress like a man. And then asks Job this series of questions. Basically helping Job to understand, you're not me. You don't understand. What has happened to you is, is evil. But don't bring my, my name into question. Final example I'll give you is Peter. One minute Peter confesses Jesus is Christ. The next minute, Peter's pulling Jesus aside and rebuking him. Jesus says, hey, the Son of Man. It's been written, the Son of Man's going to go to Jerusalem, going to die, three days later, rise. He'll be crucified, he'll be beaten, he'll be tortured. Peter pulls him aside, rebukes him. Right? And there's other, other examples, it's always amusing to me how Martha, John the Baptist, Peter, everybody wants to tell God how to be God. Let me, let me help you to be a better God. You're not doing it just great. You're not doing it just... You're not really being God right now. Of course, need I remind you how the Jews crucified the Lord of glory when we talk about acting in arrogance and violence towards God. So there's three primary truths regarding God and good and evil that I want to emphasize this morning from Scripture. One, the first one is God is good and no evil resides in him nor does he author or create anything that is evil. God is good. No evil resides in him. Yet, God controls both good and evil. He is sovereign over all acts of his created beings. And, the third, God uses all things, even evil, to fulfill his purposes, which ultimately lead to his glory 
and the good of all believers. The good of all believers. Number one, God is good, and no evil resides in him, nor does he author or create anything that is evil. At the end of day six, God blessed Adam and Eve, and everything that he made is told to us to have been very good. Genesis chapter one. It was all very good. Why were we created? Why were Adam and Eve created? To experience a loving, eternal relationship with God. And how does that come about? Through worship and delight in His glory. Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. And this is what is taking place right now for those that have gone before us in Christ Psalm 150 let everything that has breath praise the Lord praise the Lord Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 worthy are you our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. So we see God is sovereign. God is the creator. We were created for a loving, eternal, peaceful relationship. Called to ascribe and praise and worship God. Not just because he is God, but because he is a good God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. God is light. God creates light. But God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God's character is eternal. It is sure. There's no variation. He never changes. He is good always. Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. S-U-N. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. There will be no night. There will be no darkness. Because God is light. Scripture makes clear that God is perfectly good all the time. But I know, I know what we are tempted to argue. But look around. How, how, how are we to reconcile the evil that we're talking about, the evil that we experience? How do we reconcile that in the fact that God is good? I want you to imagine a, a little girl full of life and love. She wants to share that love with a puppy. Will she find more satisfaction in having a stuffed animal puppy or in a real puppy? Because a stuffed animal puppy, you stay, you stay, stay. Good boy, good boy. Oh, do you want to eat? Okay, come on, man. You can eat this. The stuffed animal puppy does obeys everything. Does everything. The real puppy. There's a chance that puppy is going to be disobedient. 
but there's a chance for love to be expressed and to be experienced and joy a relationship God could have just made us automatons. Do this, do that. He didn't create us to sin or to see us rebel. But he has given us that freedom of choice. And as humans, we bear the responsibility of our choices. You know, Satan chose to rebel, and what happened? He was cast out. Adam and Eve chose to sin, and they were cast out. Human beings have chosen to sin, have chosen the evil over the good. Cast out. But God but a good God, a gracious God, a just God. He didn't create us to kill us. He didn't create us to cast us out. He knows our nature. And he's provided a way for us to be reconciled to him. We are guilty before God because we have chosen to rebel. We weren't created for evil. We've chosen it. Our actions, therefore, cannot be attributed to or laid at the feet of God. Humans choose what their hearts are most inclined to choose. If you're a baseball fan and I offer you Braves tickets or Atlanta United tickets, your heart is most inclined to choose the Braves tickets. You're a baseball fan. If I offer you the chance to go on vacation and you love the city, and the offer is you can go to New York City or you can go to Montana, you're gonna choose the city vacation. That's what your heart is inclined to choose. So how about our hearts? Human beings, what are our hearts most inclined to do? Serve and worship God or serve and worship self? We are sinners and prone to evil by nature. Second sub point here moral goodness cannot be produced apart from God's bestowing it. Moral goodness cannot be produced unless God has bestowed it. Acts chapter 17, verse 25. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God is the giver of all good gifts. Any goodness that you and I experience it's because it's been given to us by a good and gracious God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? And what have we received? Grace upon grace both the just and the unjust. God brings rain. God is merciful. Because God's desire is not to punish people. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. John chapter 1, verse 16. But God is a just God as well as a good God. Why grace upon grace? Because God is long-suffering and merciful, longing that we might repent 
so that we can receive forgiveness and live with him in perfect goodness and holiness. And this is what David, a man after God's own heart, understood the end of 1 Chronicles chapter 29, picking up in verse 10. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. All goodness that is produced in the world results from the direct causative agency of God, meaning he directly causes it. Especially that goodness that comes through human choice and action because we are not good. Only God alone is good. You remember, Jesus says that himself. No one is good except God alone. Therefore, God should rightly receive all the glory for the good that is done by God human beings. But what do human beings do? Boast and take credit. Steal. Are proud and arrogant. Because God is good and wants people to experience his goodness, he offers the incapable a means to know him in his goodness. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him from the lips of Jesus Christ? Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Did you catch that first part? If you then, who are evil. Now, Pastor Mike saying this. Hard to misinterpret that verse. God gives. And God gives the gift of eternal life. God is so good that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? We had no capability. Completely unable. Dead. <coughs> there is no boasting. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Your light. We are Brothers and sisters in Christ, the light of Christ is given to us. That light given to us to shine out of us. Why? So that others may see our good works, the works that we've been empowered, we've been predestined. To accomplish, for what purpose? To give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's all from 
our good and gracious God. Who's the light? God. What enables and causes me to do good? God. Therefore, who gets the glory? God. For those who are saved, before God worked in our hearts, we were bound in slavery to sin, blind to the truth, spiritually dead, and unable to do anything that pleased God. God caused us to be born again while we were still sinners. Why? Because he's good. Therefore, there is no boasting. Why are you saved? If I were to ask you this question, I will ask you this question. Answer it silently. Why, why are you saved? If your answer starts with, because I, I'm not saying you're not saved, there's a problem. Because he, because he predestined, because he elected, because he justified, because he sanctifies, because he glorifies, because he Additionally, we're able to walk with God and abide with God because of his direct causative agency. That is the Holy Spirit living within us. This is a fearful and wonderful thing, and Paul understood it as such. That's why he admonishes us to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work, listen to this, for his good pleasure. The Greek word is eudakia, excuse me, eudakia. I actually, I spelled this phonetically because I'm terrible at Greek. Eudakia, it means good will, kindly intent, benevolence. God is pleased to work good in you and through you for your benefit, the benefit of others, and for his glory. And scripture makes clear that God is eternally, unchangeably good. Point number two, yet God controls both good and evil. He's sovereign over all the acts of his created beings. So God is not responsible for sexual abuse or murder. Yet God does permit these evils to occur. And scripture is abundantly clear regarding this truth. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I, am he. And there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. Lamentations 3, verse 38. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Psalm 115, 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. The second part of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And Isaiah chapter 45, verses 5 to 7. <clears throat> I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Even though God permits evil, evil does not dwell in him, nor does he approve of evil or desire evil, and neither is his eternal and holy nature compromised by the evil that is carried out by Satan and his followers. In fact, God hates evil and those that perpetrate evil. Psalm 11, verse 5. The Lord tests the righteous, 
but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. Psalm 139, verses 21 through 22. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. And God promises to punish the evildoers who are his enemies. Everyone who is arrogant in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Be assured, he will not go unpunished. Proverbs 16, 5. Be assured, an evil person will not go unpunished. Proverbs 11, verse 21. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Colossians 3, 25. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his agents. From the lips of Jesus Christ himself, Matthew 25, verse 41. But why? Why does God allow and permit evil acts to occur? How can any good come about from these horrible events? Let me ask you this. Who are we to question our holy and perfect God? You turn things upside down. Shall the potter be regarded as the clay? That the thing made should say of its maker, he did not make me. Or the thing formed, say of him who formed it, he has no understanding. It's Isaiah chapter 29, verse 16. Isaiah 45, verses 9 to 11. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles? Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him, ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? Are you going to tell me how to be God? Do you know? Do you see? Were you there when the foundations of the world were laid? We deceive ourselves into thinking that because we are created in the image of God, that we have the infinite knowledge of God, that intellectually we are on or near the same level as God. God is immortal, and he's sufficient to himself, the aseity of God. Fully sufficient. He's independent of anything outside of himself. It's hard to comprehend. I remember being a relatively new Christian. Heather and I are driving home with our kids from a great day of worship and church. And uh, I was asking the kids, as I'm, I want to do, uh, you know, on the ride home, a question or two and just seeing what they picked up. And our youngest, Chloe, from the back, she says, Dad, if God made everything, who made God? I turned to Heather, I'm like, you want to handle this one? <laughs> <laughs> Out of the mouth 
have a babes. You know, she, her little mind, God is working, trying to help her to search and seek and figure it out. You know, it's okay to come to God with questions. There are many things that I don't understand. Even that example I read to you from Revelation, the saints, those who have been mourned, they're asking, God, when? But how do you come? Do you, do you come to God in humility? Do you come to God weeping? Do you come to God just desiring to know? Coming trusting? Even, even if you don't answer God. I know you're here. We are completely dependent on the goodness, grace, and mercy of God. You know, it's undeniable when you look at Scripture that God controls all things, both good and evil. Understanding why, to use a, a phrase, of our day is above our pay grade, so to speak. What we are charged with, however, is to walk by faith, not by sight. Just because we can't see it, just because we don't understand it, does not mean that God is not both omnipotent and good. Isaiah chapter 55, starting in verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. There is a, we are created in the image of God, we are not God. There is a clear distinction. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Even right now, this moment, The word that is going out from this pulpit, not my word, the word of God, it is going out for a purpose and it has power and it will have its effect on each of our hearts. God knows the beginning from the end. He has a plan and he is working that plan. Do you trust him? Do you know him? Do you believe in him? Do you believe that God is good and that he's working all things together for good for those that love him? Doesn't mean we don't hurt. Doesn't mean we don't weep. Doesn't mean we don't suffer. Doesn't mean the pain's not real. why Jesus came, was born of a woman, and lived as a human being. He knows. He knows what it is to be human. The death of Lazarus, he wept. God is good, yet he controls both good and evil. Point three, and God uses all things, even evil, to fulfill his purposes, which ultimately lead to his glory and the good of all believers. But what is the meaning of these tragedies? How are we to understand them? We'll go back to the passage I opened with in Luke chapter 13. Jesus asked, do you think these people were any worse sinners than any of y'all?
evil flows from sin, and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and none is righteous, no, not one. Sin brings forth evil consequences. God is just. Goodness is God's just standard. God is faithful and true. He shows no partiality. If you eat, you will die. God is merciful. Turn and live. Repent and believe. God is God and there is no other. He is the sovereign over all creation. But what about these people? What about these, what about these Galileans? What about the people that the tower fell on? What about those kids? What about those shoppers? You notice how Jesus answered that question? What does he say? Unless you repent, you will also perish. He doesn't answer. The end of the Gospel of John, one of my most favorite accounts, Jesus tells Peter, restores Peter, tells Peter how he's going to die. Peter's looking around and he sees John, the apostle John. And he says, Lord, what about him? Like, what's going to happen to him? And Jesus says to him, basically, don't worry about him. You worry about you. I'm in control. I've created both of you for a purpose. You worry about you. Your calling. Walk your walk. Why? Because behold, all souls are mine. They're God's. He is sovereign. So I don't have the answers. I don't know. Somebody asked me this week, do you think, do you think any of those kids were saved? I could make a biblical argument. Possibly, but I don't know. I don't know the people who were shot and killed. I, I don't know. W were there Christians among them? Maybe. But I know this. God created each one of these people. And the question that each of us needs to be asking is not, what about them? It's, what about me? Am I a sinner? Yes. Will I die? Yes. Is this God's desire for me? No. Can I change myself? Can a leper change his spots? No. Is there a way for me to be changed? Yes. What must I do? Repent and believe. What will happen if I don't? You will die in your sin. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. Hosea 6.1 For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. Job 5.18 Why should a living man complain, a man, about the punishment of his sins? Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Lamentations 3, 39 through 41. I'm also reminded of this. The most evil and unjust act to ever occur in the history of mankind was allowed to occur so that I might turn and live.
The question is not, why do we experience evil? The real, <coughs> unsearchable question is this. Why are we allowed to experience any good? For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Thank God for his steadfast faithfulness, which is promised to us through his holy and perfect word. Everyone in this room is going to die someday. Everyone that you see today is going to die someday. Some will die in their sins. And the world that they inherit will be one of untold torment and evil, absent of any of God's goodness. Now, that should grieve us. And those that die in their sins will have chosen to die this way, having had eyes to see they will have chosen to remain blind. Having had ears to hear, they will have chosen not to hear. They will have chosen the evil over the good. Pride over humility, and even when they are confronted with their incurable condition, they will refuse the one who has the ability to cure them. It's insanity. Others will die in Christ and dwell with God. Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 to 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. <coughs> so what is the solution to the supposed problem of evil? Jesus Christ, and him crucified and resurrected. And he's come to deliver humans from the bondage of sin to which they are enslaved, to lead us out of this world, corrupted by evil, and follow him to a place of peace, rest, and eternal goodness. Yet, mention Jesus Christ and his gospel to a supposed good people and see the hate and evil that is unleashed. And the problem is not with God. The problem is with the man in the mirror. Let's close. Psalm 147, verses 1 to 6. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. <coughs> He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Lord, we just come before you this morning. thankful and grateful for your word, which is a light to our feet, because you are light, because you are good. Help us to not walk into the temptation of arrogantly questioning you. Holy Spirit, convict us, keep us humble. Remind us always to seek out your word, which has the answers, the deep answers to the deep things of our great and mighty God. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. We pray this in the precious and mighty and supreme and good, good name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good day and God bless.